Hi, and welcome to episode 17 of Talent Acquisition Trends and Strategy. Today, we're joined by Jim Wink. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time being here. Yeah, we're, we're excited to host you. Ed, before we jump into the topics we want to discuss today, could you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I, uh, I've been in talent acquisition my whole career. I started in the, in the 80s and the 90s in, um, in temporary placement agency work, and then I got into contracting, government contracting, supporting um, uh, government integrators for the last 24 years, and uh, basically been consulting contracting that whole time. And just in the last six months, I became actually a direct employee of Okta, uh, a company that is not in government, mostly in government contracting. It's a San Francisco-based uh, uh, tech firm. So uh, I've been pretty much covered the whole, all of IT. I've done many different variations of uh, uh, proposal work, uh, attempt to fill type work, uh, any kind of... Um, we, we've I've been on large contract wins. We've had to fill X amount of hire, have had X amount of fills in, in 90 days, 120 days, two or 300, 180 days, that kind of thing, that kind of thing. Um, the incumbents capture work, uh, pretty much the gambit of any kind of talent acquisition within um, government integration. Yeah, it's uh, we were just talking before the show started too. Uh, I, I feel like we're, you know, we're both kind of in the DC area. Uh, both working in commercial tech, which is is not you you know not typically what I see. Most of the, right. the people in this area, right, are, are still actively in in the GovCon space. So it's cool to to be able to speak with somebody in the local market that is uh, in a similar space to to what what I do as well. So um, yeah, I'm really pumped about that. And so there's there's a few shared experiences, right? Both both of us are, are in the DC area working in tech. Uh, you know, the other thing that I, I know you you come from a traditional agency background, contingent agency doing temp and perm. Uh, on the contingent side, I, I would, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on how coming from an agency background has kind of shaped who you are as a recruiter and, and, and how it influences maybe, you know, how you go about sourcing and attracting talent for Okta now. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's, that's a great, great point question. I mean, I, I definitely feel that coming from the background that I had in the agency business, I, I, I come, I came to to contracting and, and, and working directly for companies with a sense of urgency that un, sometimes a lot of people just don't have because they didn't come up in the in the business in in, in the agency business. Whereas uh, uh, some people who just go directly work for a CSC or uh, just any kind of government integrator, SAIC, they they come to work, they have their job, they perform their job. Whereas when when you have the background that we have you perform or you don't keep your job. And that's a big deal if you want to keep working. So um, you, you know, have a sense of urgency and that, uh, and that, and that is like it permeates my, my everyday process. And, and, and sort of back when I was in college, I knocked on doors for a summer and that comes from that knocking on door. I never want to go through an area and not knock on every single door. So in my situation where I do sourcing and recruiting, I always want to reach out to every candidate I feel is a match for what I the skill sets that I'm looking for. Uh, I never want to pass anyone by, and I always return every voicemail or email. Well, that's uh, that. How do you go about doing that? That's uh, I well, with candidates actively in your funnel, or what about candidates that maybe reach out to you that you you didn't engage with, right? Uh, and, and proactively, when you were on the agency side, where did you have the bandwidth to respond to? To everybody, even if it's um, you know, people that you weren't that weren't in the interview funnel, or is it like what, what I do? Generally what, speaking, because everything I do, everything I've done is always proactive. It's very, it's ne never really reactive. It's always proactive. So everyone I reach out to, if they respond to me, um, mm -hmm. then I always follow up. I never leave the phone, the the message un uh, un unresolved, you know, unresponded to. I never leave the email. I mean, uh, I always felt that way because I always would hope that someone would re respond to my email or my phone call and return. So I always felt the courtesy to, you know, particularly like today, I, I don't know if we're gonna get into it or not the specifics of, of like the tools that we use, but LinkedIn's a very, very popular tool right now. And um, and it's really important to me that I, I, I connect with people and I let them know that I appreciate their connection and I have the dialogue going right there in, 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 in regards to building a relationship and communicating with people. I, I don't feel like you can over communicate on the side of the business where I am, which is in sourcing and talent acquisition, which is in the first step between the candidate and the company. Mm -hmm. 
I, I don't feel like you can ever communicate that enough. I don't pursue the people who have applied online and things like that, which is more reactive. I let the recruiting staff handle that because I'm in town. I'm in sourcing and specifically sourcing. We go after the um, the people that are more hard hard to engage. Right, right. The passive talent that's not necessarily right. applying to the for the right. jobs, right? Um, well, that's 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 great, and I'm I'm very excited to speak with a, somebody who's an expert in sourcing because that is a, a perspective that we really haven't dialed into on the show yet. Um, so this is this is going to be some really valuable right. valuable content for the community. So very excited. You, you mentioned tools. So let's just start there. Uh, you know, I've been looking for a way to deleverage off LinkedIn for years. I mean, the bill that we have with LinkedIn is just, it seems like quarter <laughs> over know. quarter, it just keeps growing. I'm like, good Lord, like right. they're making so much money from us, but uh, obviously it's a very valuable tool. And, um, you know, I enjoy working with the team over there. I, you know, nothing, it's usually a pretty good experience, but I, I will say that, um, I would love to be able to deleverage. I mean, we've, we've experimented with different job boards. We use different tools like Jim, uh, for, for email outreach. Um, you know, we, we've done things to try to switch it up, but I would say 85, 90% of the hires we make for our clients so that, that are all, you know, 150 startups, growth stage, uh, technology organizations are, you know, coming through outbound sourcing efforts on LinkedIn. Are, are you seeing something similar or have you, have you all been able to deleverage off LinkedIn a little bit? Like what's well, that like? Yeah. Truthfully, LinkedIn is a great tool. No doubt about it. They had, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands or millions, millions of people are, are, are on LinkedIn. So it's a great tool. Yes. To answer your question, um, because of my, the nature of what I do, um, for, uh, for the last eight previous to Okta for, from 2014 to 2022, I was, uh, the, uh, supporting Raytheon technologies and the, um, um, the cleared community and the clear community is a very challenging, uh, community to engage because of different reasons, clearances and, and, and security. So I had to come up with ways outside of just LinkedIn and, and, one, one tool that works really well, like Seek Out or Hire EZ, it used to be a higher tool, now Hire EZ, they, they, they do a nice job of, again, there's a cost involved in that. I don't know the cost. Um, they do a nice job of, like Hire EZ does a nice job of doing a search and it grabs people that are on LinkedIn and it grabs people from GitHub and other sources. And it does that, that drip campaign we'll talk about later and that reach out and that, and that, um, and that a proactive reach out. But um, I have uh, figured out a way to use um, free link, the free LinkedIn tool as opposed to the LinkedIn recruiter tool to really my advantage. And, um, and just to throw out some metrics, I don't have specific numbers, but I know I get generally about a 20 to 25% return on my e emails. For instance, when I lose, use LinkedIn recruiter, I get 40% plus when I reach out to people on the, um, on the free tool. Oh, okay. So, so right, it's, it's, a much, it's a much different dynamic. Yeah. So, so let's dive into that because that, so that surprises me. That's, that's really cool. So I, I want to learn more about that. And um, you know, I, I know for instance, even in my team of recruiters here at secure vision are going to be very interested to, to learn about what you're doing there. And, and obviously the community out there in the town acquisition community. So could you tell us a little bit about what that process looks like well, and, and sure. what drives that type of result? Sure, I can tell you that. What I do, um, generally speaking, in LinkedIn, when someone uses LinkedIn Recruiter, which is no fault of anyone, I do the same thing. You'll reach out to people that fit jobs. You'll do job searches. You, and you're very, it's very um, robust uh, search. You can do a, a Boolean search string. You can, you can compare racks. You can search on people who are similar to the candidates that you find that look good. So you, you do those searches and you reach out to people because you want to you want to offer them an opportunity to, to come to work. You want to see if they're interested in, if they're available. Whereas um, in LinkedIn, in the LinkedIn, the free tool, it doesn't have as robust of a search engine, but to dig around through there, and I, I, uh, I can't do this while we're talking now, but right. there is a way to dig through that site to do searches. Again, they don't really want you to do searches. <laughs> if they heard me talking, they'd probably think you really don't want to hear them say that, but they don't want you to do that many searches because they want you to use a LinkedIn recruiter tool, but mm -hmm. you can use LinkedIn as the free tool to do searches, not quite as robust, the, 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 the bullying string has to be much so, shorter, but you can go through the people, then you can go through locations, you can target candidate, target companies and things like that, where you can get a very targeted search still, even though you're not using the LinkedIn recruiter tool. And you can, so you can do that process free. And, and also when you reach out, it's very limited. I think it's 100, 180 characters, maybe it's 150 characters. So I only have time to say who I am, 
who I represent, I want to link in with you. I want to talk. I want to connect with you. Or if it's a second connection, if it's number two connection, we have connect mutual connections. I'd love to connect with you. Those kind of things. Building that, getting that first step in building a connection. And again, I don't know why, but I get about a 40% return on people who I'm just saying, hey, I'm in the industry. I want to connect with you. Mm-hmm. And and so that so that's wow. Um now 40%. And I follow up with that. I don't right. mean to interrupt you, but I follow up with that sure. because then once they connect with me. Then I say, hey, thanks for the connection. I'd love to sit down with you and have a discussion about our opportunities whenever you, if you're ever interested in making a change or a change of scenery or, or, and then I get that engagement. And, but they're connected with me. So they'll see all my postings, which I'm sure most companies are trying to do now. They want to post as many things as we can, you know, different things, different uh, information about who we are, what we do. And then they'll get used to that. And then four months, five months down the road, six months down the road, I, I, I connect with them again because I have this whole process. Hey, we connected six months ago, four months ago. If you're ever interested, let me know. That really basic um, passive approach really works really well. Yeah. And I started it in the uh, IC, in the intelligence community. Yeah, because so I guess that was my next question. Do you feel like Okta obviously has a very good brand in tech? Most people have heard of Octa, at least that have been in tech for a minute, right. right? So do you feel like that helps drive some of the response rates that you're seeing? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Raytheon had a great name too. Um, all mm-hmm. the companies I supported, um, SAIC, um, Lidos, they've all had really good names. Now, what I tell you, it's really funny. A week and a half ago, I think Okta posted their, their quarterly earnings. And the next day, their stock jumped 16%. I got like double engagement the three or four days after that because people saw the stock jump 16% and tech stocks doing so poorly now. We know that, but that jump, that kind of information totally, totally uh, will will drive your engagement. If you can post stuff, get positive information about your company out there, that'll definitely drive your um, engagement and success. Yeah. And I I guess my, my next question would be, have you ever been put in LinkedIn jail? Where where they they don't let you send out invites. Correct. That's happened I to see, me a few I, times. I have not. Lucky. But, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but because of that, drove me to figure out a way to use the LinkedIn. <coughs> excuse me, the, the free LinkedIn account. Because yes, um, if you don't maintain a thirteen percent uh, response rate, and you know you lose your access to, to to or you get a warning, I think, then you lose your you lose your access to to send multiple email in mails at once. And true, that that's, I, I mean. I, I don't want to lose LinkedIn, but I can't live without if I had to. So, I mean, I, I'm in that position where, and I, I know companies are like that. Companies look at the look at the look the um, the return on investment, and it's significant the cost involved, as you know, um, mm-hmm. for for the LinkedIn recruiter accounts. And um, there there are going to be in the future need to get away from that kind of that spend that kind of spending. Right. I mean, so I, I, uh, there was a, a few times when I was an individual contributor where I, uh, I guess I sent re- connection requests to too many people I didn't know. And then basically LinkedIn made it. So I had to put in somebody's email address in order to connect with them. Right. And there was one time, so they gave me a few warnings and then they put me in jail for like <laughs> right. six months and then they let me out of jail. And then I just kept pushing it. Right. And, and then they put me in jail for like three years. Oh my, did, okay. Yeah, they for a long time I thought I was never getting out, and, and you're, finally you're really a bad dude. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, just a, a bad person, I guess. <laughs> I was on the blacklist. No, I'm kidding. I wasn't that bad, but um, they they eventually I, I reached out to their success team. And I was like, look, like I'm not spamming my network. I'll change my 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 posting habits. I'm you know I'm posting a lot of valuable content. Uh, it's getting high engagement. Uh, I really am just trying to be a value add to the community, and I had to really fight. Uh, to get out of it. And so now I'm, you know, uh, I, I, you know, fortunately I, I, it's, I, it's been, it's been good since I got out. I think I got out in early 2020 and they finally let me out. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's that balancing act. Like, I think that's why it's so the response rates on those, um, uh, uh, invite requests are, are so important because if, if they drop a little bit too low on the free LinkedIn, then, you know, LinkedIn can, can, will ultimately just, uh, yes. uh, they, they, know. because I was doing it pretty regularly, they, they will catch on if you do too much. Right. Um, so I always tell people, if you're going to try that, don't reach out to more than like a hundred people in a week. Cause that seems unnatural. If it seems natural and people are just linking in with other people, they're okay with that. 
But um, if, you're, if they can tell you're using it as a recruiter tool, they'll start sending you notes saying, you know, you really shouldn't be doing that and blah, blah. You know, right, we want you to pay, you know, 10 yeah, grand. Yeah, yeah. So, but I've gotten around that. I haven't had that issue in several months and I, since last year. And I slowed, I, you know, slowed my roll on that. I, I stopped reaching out to, I was, you know, at one point I was doing like 20, I was doing like maybe 50 a day. Right. I was getting yeah, so much engagement. I was getting so much engagement. So yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're smart about it, you can use that free tool and use it very successfully. Cool. Uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about Octa's tech stack. You know, what is for everything from sourcing to you know full lifecycle recruiting? Like, what does the tech stack look like uh, right now? Well, um, you mean how do you mean? Like, which just what what tools are you you currently engaging with to source talent to really, interview talent to evaluate everything? Right. I mean, uh, generally speaking, I mean, like the tools that uh, we, we have a sourcing group mm -hmm. and we have talent acquisition, we have recruiting and we have managers of the recruiters. But generally speaking, the process is um, we use we use a LinkedIn recruiter, but we also have hire easy. And some people have seek out um, and, and in regards to engagement. I actually think that some people might have dice dot com okay. for the software engineering folks. Um, I don't think people use like the boards like Monster or Career Builder, but um, and we in our in our um, CR we use um, Greenhouse as our uh, as our as CRM. It's pretty mm -hmm. good. I mean, um, but we're getting and that that's always a tool that can be changed, right? You can always add, uh, you can always reach out to people through that that tool as well. But um, generally right. speaking, it's it's those are our main go tos. Okay. And, and so Hire Easy, you said basically pulls candidates from LinkedIn as well as from GitHub and different sources. Uh huh. Yeah. I think they have dozens of sources, but those are the big dozens. ones. Okay. And then it basically drops people into email cadences. So it's also, it has like, it's a data tool as well. It's That's beautiful. Cool. Right. I mean, it, 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 it's the set up, you set up a project and you do the search and then um, you set up your message and your cadence, your sequencing of messages and it allows you to set up the time that the message goes out, the day it goes out, your follow-up, your follow-up to your follow-up. And again, not talking about numbers, my 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 response rate is is much, much higher on that second, third, or fourth email than on the first one. Mm. Uh, generally speaking, the last email that I send said that I say, hey, I'm not gonna bother you anymore. Obviously, you're busy. If you're interested in, in, in talking to me, let me know. And people respond to that about about a third to half of my responses come from that last that last note. I know that we know that we need to re, we need to reach out to people more than once, mm. and that's when you get with LinkedIn Recruiter. You can reach out to people, and I think you have to wait maybe thirty days to reach out again or something. Whereas mm. with the sequencing tools like Seek Out or Hire Easy, you can reach out, set up a sequence, and it comes out like it's coming. It's an email coming from your email, okay. and it goes to their inbox. And uh, and they can respond. And what's great about that is once they respond, it drops off the sequencing. They won't get any more emails, and that right. kind. of they can respond to not be be emailed. But it's it, it's a it's I, I find to have great success with that um, sequencing that I can send them. You know, I like to change my times that I send emails. Obviously, I change my messaging. Every message is a different message. Every message, and I and I like to um to to put video links something in that message. That's interesting to the candidate, not just, hey, I want to hire you, right? And we all have training. We all know that we have to come up with creative messaging. And um, I won't get into that too much because I feel like I'm <laughs> feeling pretty creative myself. But um, that the creative messaging is, is so, so terribly important. Okay, gotcha. I, and I, I guess I wanted to follow up question on the tech stack would just be, so what are the differences between Hire Easy and Seek Out? So, because I, I, I thought Seek Out was similar in a sense. I thought it was- They're very similar. Okay. Um, I know, like for us, we were having a hard time getting the, um, they're connected to our, our CRM, our easy is so I can, so I can follow track things through there. Seek out was more difficult to connect to the CRM. So um, it was difficult to follow our engagement mm. and our, pro our engagement process and our engagement success. Yeah. And we can follow it very easily. Hire easy talks to our, um, our to, to our um, CRM very, very efficiently. Okay. I, but they are very similar. Um, I use these, I use seek out. I use them both. I sure. do not, I use, I have used seek out. So I have used them both. Um, some prefer seek out, some prefer hire easy. And I'm sure there's others out there that do the same type of um, um, aggregating, aggregating, you know, the whole 
Do you have any uh, data on which one is uh, pulling in more hires or? I don't. At this point, yeah. I do not. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have that kind of information. No worries. Yeah, just curious. Curious to see what you're seeing out there. Um, but, you know, I'd love to also just get your thoughts on what you're seeing right now uh, in the market. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of choppiness happening in, in tech right now. A lot of volatility we're seeing. There is. More layoffs, mergers. Uh, so, so just can you tell me a little bit about what you're seeing from your perspective and, and, and just how it's impacting talent acquisition right now in tech? I think there's a lot of going on, and like you said, in tech space. Um, we have a site. I don't have the actual site, unfortunately, available that I could give to you that, that, that lists the layoffs on a, very, on a daily basis. Like layoffs or mergers, any kind of, any kind of um, disruption in a company's money flow, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 that and I don't, I'm not swooping in, but what I'm doing is offering companies that, I'm not going to list the companies, right? Um, but the companies who have, who have layoffs, who have mergers, who have issues, I like to talk to them. I reach out to specifically target, but reach out to those people who work in my space in those companies and say, hey, I understand something, you know, what's, I understand you may, something may be going on there. I like to phrase it like, you know, if any, you know, I, I know you, have, I know the company's a good company. I never bad mouth anyone. Sure. Good company, good company in the past, but I know there may be some, uh, some changes. Is there some changes you want to talk to me? Let me know. And I like to talk and I, we can set up a time to chat. Um, I, I, so I've been targeting, I don't say aggressively targeting, but specifically targeting companies who are in the are in the news. I mean, it's public information, right? You know, they're in the news for 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 like I said, mergers or or um, any kind of riff layoff and 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 reaching out to those people because a lot of those people are just they just caught caught up in the numbers and they they're they're they're, they're very capable. It doesn't just because they get riff doesn't mean they're not they're not quality, well, right? And you know, so some companies were even rescinding offers prior to start date, so yeah. it's just like nothing to do with performance or anything, right? right? It's just. Uh, you know, I guess they, I guess they just aggressively overhired, right? So that that's what I suggest for anybody who's who's in our industry is mm -hmm. pay attention to the um to the layoff information and and um, use your tool. You can target any tool. You can target companies like LinkedIn. Hire any tool you have. You can. They're all built to be able to target. Even Dice.com, you can target companies. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, well, it's uh it's pretty nuts right now. I mean, are you are you seeing um. Are you seeing higher engagement from employees at, at these companies or at the same time, though, it's like I feel like every so many recruiters are reaching out to them that it is. Still... And that's where that's where your messaging has to stand out. And um, yeah. and then I do stupid. I don't want to say stupid, but I do quirky things like I'll put you know a little rocket ship next to my company name for taking off. Right. And that little that little, you know, um, uh, that little drawing catches people's attention, right? I mean, right. anything that catch people's attention that might be, a, yeah, it might be silly, but it, it works. Uh, I just, I mean, I, my numbers will go up when I use a little, so I use my little rocket ship, that kind of stuff in my subject line. I have to separate myself from my competitors like Ping or One Identity or, um, or Microsoft even. I mean, Microsoft does what we do. So I have to separate ourselves and, and, that, and that can start with my messaging. Yeah, for sure. And and without giving away your 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 secret sauce, like what else? What else do you have any tips for how people can go about personalizing messages or or just being? Is it is it really just less so of a motion of this is how to do it? Just make sure you are different. Just try you different. You are things, right, correct. Ahead. Make sure you're different. You're not asking the same basic questions. I like the idea of keeping it as short as possible. And mm -hmm. some people don't mind the lengthy message. But for me personally, I like to keep it as short as possible. I, I don't want people to get bored with the, with the note. So I keep it as short as possible. And I like to have a link with a, with a video or something. Um, we're, the company I support now is very creative. The company I've supported in the past, they've been relatively creative with their links. I mean, their videos. And I mean, I'm not a huge fan of sending links, but I think they can tell it's pretty secure. Um, I mean, we're a security company. <laughs> Right, <laughs> right. security management. So I think they can trust the link that I send them because a lot of people are a little iffy about opening links on their phone. But um, yeah, I'd like to send a link that says this is who we are, or this is what we do, or this is why why Octa, right? Why not? And then here's a little bit of a and, and our and our creative our creative teams put together really attractive videos for that that purpose. Yeah, it's uh, I, I know it's 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 obviously very competitive out there. And just because there's layoffs occurring in tech does not mean that we aren't right. in a very competitive tech market, a hiring market right now, which we we still are at this point in time. 
Um, have you seen, you know, from your perspective, do you see the market cooling off a little bit? Do you see, you know, candidate response rates rising over the past couple of months? What, what are you, are you seeing any trends there? Well, I, I, I think for me, I have not seen much of a change okay. um, over the last several months. I think things can change. I don't want to get into politics, but things do change around the election time. People do have a tendency to potentially bat down the hatches, so to speak, because they don't know about this, you know, particularly about presidencies when they don't know if things are going to change with their money, their taxes and things like that. But, but for the last six months, I think the stock market has really also kind of done that same thing where people are very weary about potentially making changes because of that. If they're not in a company that's having any issues, if their company's doing well and they're happy, they're probably not going to engage because of, because of that specific. I mean, it's, it's, I, I think that doesn't help us to having the stock market being so volatile over the last, since January it doesn't help our situation in engaging people. But, but Jeff, that would be my change. I would see a drop. I, and I think, I think over the last month or so from personally, for me, things have gone well because of, because Okta's continual presence and their, or I'm sorry, their, their, their information they're getting out about how well the company's doing. Sure. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, that's a true differentiator. If they can show consistency and growth throughout all this volatility in tech, uh, that's definitely going to be very impressive and help. Um, I, I curious to get your thoughts too on, you know, Okta, I believe I was listening to a, a podcast of, um, I think it was with your VP of talent acquisition. I don't know if it's the current one or somebody that was there a year or two ago. I don't know. Um, but one of the things uh, that they were talking about was offer acceptance rate being a primary you know, metric that Okta was using. And um, the fact that your team actually has a pretty high offer acceptance rate um, for the size of company. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but it had, it had been, it had risen significantly over the past couple of years. I, I wanted to see, you know, what are the core kind of benefits or um, perks or, 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 or things that Okta is doing to attract talent right now um, that, that allows them to be so competitive on the market. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think speaking of, speaking of that, I think um, generally um, one, it's always nice to offer a competitive salary. And, you know, I mean, if, if, X, if X person makes 300K doing a job, he's not gonna come to work or she's not gonna come to work for you for less. So you have to, I may have an opportunity, you have to, you have, to have some reason to say, okay, well, this is who we are, this is what we do, and we, we can pay X, and this is what we can do down the road or whatever. I mean, so we have to be, number one, you have to be very competitive with the market. And, and, and I think generally speaking, people pretty much tell you, this is, this is what my expectation is. So I think that starts, I think we have a pretty good acceptance rates to answer your question. We have a pretty good acceptance rates, acceptance rate, because I think we do a good job up front. We don't get into the position where from time to time it may happen, but we don't get into the position where we have a job that pays, you know, hundred K and we're going to be talking to someone who makes 150 K. And we're going to get them through the whole process. They're going to turn out, turn down a job because it pays 100K. So we really do a good job of qualifying the candidate, making sure they're available, they're interested, the, the, the location's right, the work's right. Then we go through the, 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 the um, processes of our interviews, our managers, the technical interviews. We do tech challenges and things like that for the technical people. And, and, and basically, I think the acceptance rate is do, we're doing very well with that is because of that, because of that, the um, pre-qualifying. And I think that's, that's super important to do that. And, and the money's right. And we have great perks. Okta does great with like, they have unlimited PTO. And I'm sure that, and I've been with the company now, I mean, for six months, I'm sure there's a limit to that, but you have unlimited PTO. They have, they have a super great, I think it's a great um, uh, health, pa health benefits package um, that I, I can compare to others within the industry. And I know it's because I've worked in a number of different places. Um, it's very, very good. And that, that's a big help too. But generally speaking, the money they, they offer on um, the restricted stock units and how that's paid, I think all of that um, helps in that making that decision for the candidate when they have multiple opportunities. Sure, sure. And, and from a process standpoint, how does it work? So does the sourcing team take the initial screening call and then it's, it's handed over to the recruiting team? Or is it uh, doing the outreach and then scheduling directly with the recruiter. How does that, does that work at Okta? 
Oh, I think the audio cut out. Are you there? I'm sorry. We all work a little bit differently, maybe, but um, we definitely, uh, my, my process is I, 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 I will talk to the candidate first. And I, I will, once I do that, and I'm comfortable with this candidate moving forward, and the candidate is comfortable with what we're doing, then I will uh, move them to the uh, uh, division recruiter. And that's their decision. They may schedule a call or they may just pass them right along to the manager and say, hey, manager, do you want to, is this someone we want to talk to? So it's, 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 a, it's kind of a, once I talk to the person, it kind of is a bang, bang, bang. It'll get in through the process relatively quickly. Um, and we try to keep that as tight as possible time-wise because we know these people have, have multiple opportunities. And we don't want people to hang out there waiting to hear from someone for two weeks. Right. And do you have, is it like, what does the process look like in terms of communication with the recruiting team? Is it weekly meetings and syncs or is it primarily yes, to we do. Black tool or what does that look like? We do. We, each of us have generally speaking, have weekly, I, I, I can speak to what I do. Sure. Um, I have weekly meetings with the recruiters, the recruiting staff, the manager of the recruiting staff I support and that recruiter. So I'm, I'm called into their meeting. They always, they have them anyway. And the, each in the recruiters are broken up into groups. And so the sources that report support those groups can call into those meetings. So we, and it's on a weekly basis to answer your question. Mm -hmm. We have a weekly company-wide meeting. We have a bi-weekly sourcer team meeting. We have a bi-weekly recruiting meeting, or uh, it might be monthly, but I think it's bi-weekly. Um, there's a recruiting team meeting. So um, we all stay relatively informed. And because we're worldwide, it's, it's always moving around to, to accommodate people who are um, in APAC. So sometimes it might be for me, East Coast, six o'clock in the evening, which is okay, because my day is done for those kinds of meetings. And it was sure. so we sort of juggle them around. And is there a specific ratio that Okta uh, targets for um, sourcing uh, partners to recruiters? Uh, like, is it a one-to-one -one type of ratio? That's a great or? question, uh, because yeah. I, that's a great question. I, to answer your question, no, there is no, so no target. I think we're getting there. Um, a year ago, we had a very, very super small team, just a couple of people. Now we were grown to, I believe, 13 or 14. On the sourcing side, right? Correct. Yeah. On acquisition, I think the total is over 100. Wow. Um, yeah. So we might be talking 10 to 12 to one right now or something. But I think, if, I think, yeah, it's a great question. So I don't have, we don't have that number, but it would be nice if it was down to like five or six to one. I think that would be optimal, right. but it's, it's nothing near that right now. And, and how is it determined what you focus on? Is it basically like the sourcing team goes to the hardest fill positions or the top priority roles? Or, I mean, what, how does, how is that determination made? It's very much like that. It, it's one, one of the things I like to say, ever since I've been in this business, who has their hair on fire, right? <laughs> Whoever has their hair on fire, they're the ones that get the attention usually. Um, and then it goes down from there. So prioritizing is definitely the, the manager's roles. I mean, they, they, they prioritize for us and, and generally speaking, it goes from the recruiter to their manager, to my manager, back to me, or it could just go from the recruiting team to me and say, hey, we do have these other meetings we have. Mm. Their priorities are, are laid out. And they could say, okay, Jim, we do need help over here or over here. Yeah. yeah. It's basically what we try to do, and this is not really new, but we try to have our sources basically continually pipelining and churning and churning the same kinds of people for the same kind of positions that we'll always have openings for. Um, like when I was at Raytheon, I, I knew we always needed fully clear software engineers for the Maryland customer or the Virginia customer. I, I knew that. I always did that. Well, here at Okta, I know we always need account executives or solutions engineers and sale, you know, the sales type solutions engineers folks in central or in the West or the East, or we always need identity access management experts. So that's what we're trying to do and, and, and create those funnels um, mm -hmm. for, for the uh, and fulfill those pipelines for, for the uh, recruiters. Do you all do any segmentation based on um, either one region or two, like the specialty? So for instance, like, are there a team of tech recruiters or a team of go-to-market recruiters? Correct. Or That's North exactly America? how it's broken down. Yep. Okay. Go to market recruiters. It's broken down by, by, um, by basically not geographical region, but more by discipline. But for sourcing, it's, it sounds like it's, across the board so Correct. sourcing is right now famous. it is it's just, it's just so you're yeah. doing everything <laughs> right now right now it is because yeah. we're 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 limp because there's just so few of us mm -hmm. such large but yes yeah that's i always find that interesting to see how how companies uh are, are doing that and, and and i think a lot of tech companies right now are more so segmenting um 
there are regions, uh, but the regions, sometimes, if there are regions at all, they're very large, right? right. The, prim well, the primary way we're I see segmentation is more so like tech, right? Or engineering. And then there's a product team and then there's a sales or go to market yeah. team, right? So. And I like it this way because this keeps you from bonking, bonking into each other. Right. Even though we have, our recruiters do source themselves as well. So that's one reason why our one, because of the fact we have, fewer sources per recruiter. They do this a lot of sourcing themselves. So, and when you go into LinkedIn or you go into our folders, you can see, okay, well, this person reached out to this person X amount of, you know, two months ago, so I'm not going to reach out again or whatever. But um, this keeps us, I think when, we, when we're segmented like this, we're broken down like this, it keeps us from continually running into each other. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's always a good thing. Yeah. Um, I, so, so in, is, uh, do, do you all have recruiters and sourcing partners that are, um, not based in the U.S. Like, do you have a presence in LATAM and EMEA? And we do. And we do. Okay, because that's um, we're seeing a lot more of that now too. Yeah, we have. I helped support some work in Germany uh, a few months ago. We have sources in German in um, in Europe in England. Mm -hmm. It supports Europe, um, and then we have Australia covered, and oh, wow. uh, we have a source there, Martin um, Freeman. He's actually a, a very well known sourcer in his part of the world, and. Um, and we and I think they're opening in South America as well because they have openings in South America. So it's it's, it's very much global, right? Uh, so yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, we're we're uh, thinking about building out a team in Latam. I mean, it's what what my the appeal to that market really is that it's the very same or very similar time zone to uh, North America. It helps. <laughs> yeah, so so it just takes away some of the headache of of dealing with yeah. some of the time zone differences. And also it increases the size of the Canada pool. Because, I mean, for instance, we have a subsidiary in Romania, uh, a lot of great people out that way. The, the issue really comes down to not a lot of them want to work US hours and that's a requirement if they're gonna be helping North America. So, right. um, you know, for when we're looking for international support, uh, specifically for North America, we actually are gonna to start to target LATAM. Uh, and then for our EMEA projects, we, we will continue to, to work within Eastern Europe, specifically Romania. Uh, but we're trying to really put people, let like empower people to work in the time zones that they're naturally in, uh, because it's it just it, there's just so much more good talent available when sure. you know, in Romania, for instance, like when we when we had the requirement to to support North America, it's like ninety percent of the workforce wasn't interested, right? And you would so you'd end up targeting companies that had a similar model. And usually the companies that had a similar model weren't necessarily in a similar space, uh, you know, not necessarily the most relevant candidates. So, um, you know, we, we, we were kind of changing that, that strategy a little bit, but um, I really do like the concept of globally distributed teams. And I think that there's some interesting strategies there when it comes to blended rates, where it's like, you can have, you know, if you need to some senior level team members based in the U S and then have uh, supporting counterparts that are in these international markets to bring down the overall budget. Um, and, and also just having people in different time zones supporting different regions can be helpful as well. So we're seeing companies do more interesting things. And, you know, there's tools like, uh, you know, deal out there or remote.com that are making it easier to hire international employees. So that's really no longer becoming a barrier. So it's, it's cool to see tech become more globalized and, and to see it's not, it's no longer just like Microsoft and Oracle, right. That, that has a subsidiary at every country. Right. It's, it's like, now we're starting to see growth stage companies, okay, we're going to go out and hire 200 engineers in Poland, right? Uh, for whatever reason, that's a, that's a really hot market right now. We're seeing a lot of engineers uh, being recruited in Poland right now. Um, so it's, we're just starting to see more companies that are startups and growth stage build globally distributed teams in different time zones right I, now. It's interesting. I will tell you, speaking to that, recruiting and sourcing in Japan compared to the United States, compared to Germany, compared to England, they're all very different. And, yeah. and you know, people who, you won't know that until you do it. And I don't want to go into all the details. We don't have enough time, but it's, the approach is very, very different than the United States as far as being open to receiving emails or messages. So that, that's something that people have to consider too, when they are, um, when they are going to, when they are considering, you know, doing something outside of the U.S. Oh yeah, I mean, every the, just the level of complexity for everything related to talent acquisition and people functions as well just gets immensely more complicated. It does um, you know what, one of the the key differences I remember when I was initially recruiting in Romania, um, 
you know, as an American, like we don't necessarily realize it until we start to travel a lot, but um, you know, we're apparently we're, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty optimistic and we're pretty outgoing <laughs> and we can be kind of loud. And uh, I think particularly in certain regions, uh, you know, like I'll just speak to Eastern Europe. I think I, I think a lot of probably people in, in the Eastern European market would probably find me a bit obnoxious <laughs> because and my messages were always like, we're building this world-class team and we're doing yeah. all this incredible stuff. And then they're just, you know, culturally, they're just kind of like, well, just chill out a little bit. <laughs> like, you know, this is very it's much different, right. It's just, I like, absolutely. thought I was over the top. <laughs> and, and, and they, and they want all the information possible. They want, at least what I, I had learned in Germany is they want all the information. Give me everything you can tell me. And as opposed to me giving out short messages that I like to do, I had to have like a four page dissertation, literally. Uh, this is what we're doing. This is who we are. This is where we are. This is where we're going. This is where we were. I mean, they needed all that information before they'd even consider responding wow. to me. So it, it's it's a very much different market. It is. And even think about that, like that, what you just said is drastically different than how it is in, in Eastern Europe, like in right. Romania or Poland or Ukraine, right? I mean, it's just like, it's, it's, uh, you have to be ready for those complexities because you can't just copy and paste a process playbook right. that works in North America and expect it to work in LATAM or expect it to work in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, you, you, and say like people functions, right? Like when you're building employment packages, the stuff that we might care about can be completely different right. than what people care about in Eastern Europe. I mean, That's I had, very true. you know, we had the, um, the COO of uh, Malwarebytes on the show and he was talking about, you know, basically in office, plans versus remote flexibility. And, you know, the, the U S organization was very much so interested in, uh, having, you know, full remote flexibility. Uh, but he mentioned that in Eastern Europe, um, you know, the, a lot of the, the, the preference of from employees was to have an office to go to at least three days a week. And so you start to see some nuance there. Like you can't just send out an employee survey globally, Right. And expect right. it. There's going to be a lot of nuance to, to how people want to work and the benefits that they're looking for and, and what they need to be successful in the role. And um, so it's, it's, I, I find that to be very interesting. So it is, it is because yeah. our culture is not the same as everyone else's. <laughs> no, definitely not. So it's, it's weird. It's like, I think ultimately like the globalization is, is, is good for several reasons. And I think it's good for growth stage companies because it opens up the talent pool. Uh, but there are certain things that, that do get a lot harder when you approach business that way. Right. Uh, you have to give a lot more thought into, you know, what's what's going to work within specific markets. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, hey, look, this is this has been a ton of fun. I know we're kind of coming up on time here. And I, I know, too, that we uh, you have a hard stop uh, at, at, at the top of the hour. So, um, you know, I, I just want to say thank you for, for joining us today. And before we jump sure. off, if people want to engage with you or follow you, how can they find you online? Um, I actually this is crazy, but I don't have a Twitter account, but um, I'm on LinkedIn. I mean, people follow me on LinkedIn at, uh, you know, it's uh, just look up Jim Wink at LinkedIn. That's, that's, that'd be great. I mean, and people can reach out to me in, in that respect and message me. Uh, but uh, I, I, uh, I know I need to do that. I need to get a little bit more socially out there, um, but LinkedIn would be the best way. Good, good to know. Um, well, thanks again. This, this was a ton of fun and, um, you know, keep us posted with how you're doing and, and I'm looking forward to doing this, uh, again sometime. Oh, absolutely. I appreciate the time. And, and certainly if you ever want to, um, ring up a chat, well, I'd be happy to talk. Okay, cool. And, uh, for everybody else tuning in, thank you so much. And, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Cool. All right. And that's it. We did it. All right.